All right. Okay. So thanks everyone uh, for attending the last session of the day um, on large language models and education. Um, so I want to start actually with a quick poll just to see where the audience is at. How many people here identify as educators? Show of hands. Okay, most people, maybe half the room. Um, how many people identify as learners? More? Okay, maybe three quarters. Um, and when it comes to the impact of large language models on um, education, in particular your, um, uh, in, in your role as an educator, would you classify yourself closer to the optimist end of the spectrum or the pessimist end? So maybe optimists first for educators. Okay, and pessimists for educators. Okay, a couple of hands, but mostly optimists. Okay. <laughs> and uh, when, for, for learners, for the learners among you, how many people are closer to the optimist end of the spectrum? Okay, and closer to the pessimist end of the spectrum. A couple of hands. Okay, so most people are optimists. That's kind of interesting. I didn't know that. Um, excellent. Okay, so when we were first planning this conference, uh, I knew I wanted to talk about large, uh, 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 large language models. Uh, I didn't know in what uh, capacity. It wasn't only as like the latest thing, uh, but as probably the most kind of exciting thing that I and many of my mentors have ever kind of experienced in uh, AI. Um, and I decided on education because I think, mo as we just saw, most people here have a direct uh, uh, relationship to it. Um, and also has, you know, the greater kind of like long-term interest. So we can talk about like, you know, LLMs and kind of the large scope that I think most of the conversations of today have taken. Um, so, you know, for example, what might the future of human learning look like uh, in a context where LLMs are, you know, not only present in their current forms, but continuing in, into, the, into the future. Um, but also they're of like immediate uh, relevance. Uh, a lot of us as educators, as learners, um, LLMs are having an immediate disruptive impact. Uh, and I think a lot of us, at least for me, like I have no idea uh, how to teach in a world with large language models. And I think a lot of us are in the same position. Uh, so I thought it'd be a great uh, opportunity for us to talk about that. Um, so the themes that we're going to try, try and cover today, uh, you know, among many are, you know, how large language models can and will be used by both teachers and learners. Um, cheating as a concern, I think that's probably maybe the most immediate prosaic uh, uh, concern that, that, that we are uh, immediately faced with. And maybe analogies to and hopefully learnings from other technological innovations in the past like calculators, computers, and so on. Um, and how human learning will change if some version of AGI, as we've been talking about today, uh, is available to most of the world through large language models. Okay, so uh, let me introduce our two amazing panelists that have agreed to uh, help guide us through this journey today. Uh, first is Lauren B Bialystok, hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, Lauren is an associate professor at OISE, the Ontario Institute uh, for Studies in Education. Uh, in the Department of Social Justice Education. Um, she's also a faculty associate at the Anne Tenenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. Uh, and she's also the acting director for the Center of Ethics at the University of Toronto. Lots of, lots of hats. Uh, her areas of expertise are ethics and uh, um, education, identity, feminist uh, uh, <laughs> philosophy, uh, and uh, uh, social and political philosophy, women's health, and sexuality. Uh, and of immediate relevance to our event today, she recently co-hosted a generative in AI, uh, sorry, generative AI in education event. Um, our second panelist is Paolo uh, Gra uh, Granata, uh, an associate professor in book and media studies at St. Michael's College here at the U of T. Uh, and he's a faculty affiliate at uh, uh, S uh, SRI. His research and teaching interests lie broadly in the areas of media uh, e e uh, ecology, media ethics, semiotics, print culture, and vi uh, visual studies. Uh, in 2019, he founded the Media Ethics Lab with the mission of studying and protecting human rights in the digital sphere. In addition to his research and teaching, uh, Paolo is also a cultural strategist, curator, and advocate of sustainable development, and a regular commenter and speaker on the future of education. And also of immediate relevance to our uh, panel here today, uh, he re recently created a new course using AI to teach. So I hope to hear more about that today. Uh, and finally, I'm Ashton Anderson. Uh, I'm going to be moderating today's panel. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of computer science here at the U of T. 
Um, and I'm coming at these questions, and I'm interested in these questions really from two points of view. One is as an educator, you know, like any other faculty member, I genuinely don't know how to teach in a world with large language models. Um, I'm very grateful, actually, that I just by luck was not teaching in this past term when they kind of exploded onto the scene. Um, and you know, I suspect that, like a lot of people, just kind of chose to ignore them. Uh, but uh, despite you know that also obviously not being a very viable solution for very long, uh, even if it is now, um, that probably is leaving a lot of you know educational currency on the table. So I'd like to know what is a better strategy than just ignoring them. Um, and second, I'm coming at this for, um, as a researcher. So I started working with my students on generative AI in 2018. Um, when we started working on developing what is now known as a foundation model uh, in the context of, of chess. So we were motivated, actually like a member of the audience, uh, by developing algorithmic teachers or AI tutors. Um, and we wanted to really build a agents that could you know, ingest data, hopefully large amounts of data about someone, uh, and give them high quality advice for how to get better at something. Um, and we chose chess because, as has been the case for many, many years in AI, happened to be a perfect model system for these questions in 2018. Um, in 2018, there was no chat GPT yet. Uh, and, you know, for example, in chess, there's tons of data. So there's literally billions of games online. Lots of people play tens of thousands of games. Um, so there's the data available on what people, what individual people's decision-making patterns are like. And we've had superhuman AI in chess for over 20 years. Um, Despite that, <laughs> at least for chess players, it's a bit of a shame, actually, that AI became superhuman in chess 20 years ago. Chess, as a pursuit, had the amazing luck of being chosen by the AI community uh, to have narrow in, uh, AI developed for it before anything else. Um, and that happened, you know, 1997 to 2005, somewhere in there, uh, chess AI definitively became uh, su superhuman. Uh, and also today, chess, human chess has never been more popular, uh, but despite those two things uh, both being true, um, chess AIs are all but useless for teaching people how to get better. Uh, and the reason for that is actually pretty simple. They're not designed for it. They're designed to play chess really well. And you know, for example, like what a chess AI is trying to do when it sees a position is play a near optimal move. It's not thinking, oh, you're a human being who's trying to learn from me, so here's what you should do as a fallible person. It's saying, here's what I should do as a near infallible machine. And those are two very different questions. Um, so in response to that, uh, we developed Maya Chess because we thought if you want to augment human learning with AI, you need to explicitly design for it. And so we made something called Maya Chess, which is a human-like neural uh, network chess engine uh, that plays like human beings at specific skill uh, levels. Uh, and it's really an analog of large language models uh, in the pure sense. So instead of predicting the next word uh, in a sentence, it's trying to predict the next move in a chess game. So it's extremely similar. Um, and we use Maya Chess as a proxy for human intelligence at different skill levels. Uh, and when someone shows up at a certain skill level that is trying to get to the next one, we use Maya Chess as a model to teach them how to get, how to, how to get there. So my own position is coming from that background. I am a big believer in the potential benefit of large language models to uh, augment human learning. Uh, but given my experience in chess, I think uh, it won't just happen naturally out of the box. You need to design explicitly for it. OK, so that's my background. Um, before we get to our panelists, the last thing I'll say is uh, discussions of large language models can take many, many different paths. Um, I'll just take explicitly a couple of things off the table so that we can keep our discussions grounded and guided. So first, uh, let's try not to talk about X risk, um, the question of how large language models impact uh, human learning is largely null and void if there's no humans around to learn. So let's just assume for the next couple of hours that we, for the foreseeable future, will not be exterminated. And secondly, uh, abolition. So as um, uh, Blaze mentioned in his keynote today, there's lots of people kind of talking about potentially abolishing large uh, language models. This discussion is also largely null and void if people if large language models are not broadly available to learners and teachers. So we're assuming for the, follow, for the following couple hours that we're going to be alive to learn for a while, and uh, we'll have access to large language models in some uh, capacity uh, as learners and teachers. 
Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, um, which is Lauren Bialystok. We'll have roughly 15 minute uh, presentations, like opening statements from each of our panelists. Then I'll have some moderated discussions. I do have some questions of my own, but largely this will be a discussion for all of us. So please, uh, as you're watching these uh, discussions, think of things that you would like to talk about, both with the panelists and with uh, each other in your capacities as learners and teachers. So, Lauren. Thank you, Ashton, and uh, thank you so much to the Schwartz Riesman Institute for this invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Um, albeit a little out of my depth. Um, I'm, I'm not nearly as versed in the actual AI side of this whole AI discussion as everybody else here. So I want to issue this disclaimer that I'm um, going to be talking about what I know about, which is philosophy of education, and probably saying things that are fairly amateur on the side of computers and artificial intelligence. So um, I am what you might call not a deep fake, but a shallow fake. I'm being very transparent about my fakeness. And at the same time, I think these are absolutely essential conversations. And I've been so, so stimulated already just in, in what I've heard today and excited to bring it back to my work because um, in education, which is largely dominated by the social sciences and my background, which is in philosophy like the humanities, um, we, we often operate as though the scientists can take care of all the science out there and we can just carry on doing what we're doing. But this is very much a situation in which it's all hands on deck and we need to be talking to each other. So I think this is a really auspicious event. Um, I'm going to be talking about cheating technology and the value of originality. Uh, so as I said, I'm a philosopher of education and primarily an ethicist. I'm interested in questions of value and in how we make and defend our judgments about, among other things, what we should teach, how we should teach, who should teach, and what to do when people disagree about these things. And um, I'm going to be assuming, without going into a lot of details in my presentation, maybe we can get into some of the details later, but I'm going to be assuming a, a sort of K to 12 backdrop to what I'm saying, K to 12, kindergarten to grade 12, in other words, formal compulsory schooling pre-college, which is where most of my work goes, although it's worth saying that I don't teach K to 12. Um, and like Ashton, I sort of miraculously dodged having to teach this last semester when ChatGPT first came out. So I haven't yet really been in the classroom other than the, the tail end of the fall semester where I had one student write a, a fascinating essay about ChatGPT using ChatGPT. That was my only exposure so far to ChatGPT in the classroom. So I also feel like this is a good exercise for me to sort of prepare myself. Um, but other caveats that might be relevant are that I only teach graduate students because OISE is all graduate, and I teach in the humanities. And so I, I feel like it's especially incumbent on people in my situation to think very critically about what it is we value when we say that a text or an expression of concepts as opposed to empirical data are being expressed in an appropriate or original way. What is it that we are valuing when we say that something is not cheating? What is the benchmark against which cheating emerges as a wrong or as, if not a moral wrong, a pedagogical error? So the fact that ChatGPT and LLMs um, promote cheating, at least on this archaic definition of cheating, is clearly not debatable. Um, and you can easily find countless expressions of panic over the ways that LLMs have <laughs> facilitated the process of cheating for those who are so inclined, made it harder to detect and so on. And um, although I'm, I'm not going to be moving toward any kind of strident or pessimistic conclusion here, I, I think Powell and I might be on slightly different sides of this, so that, that should make for some interesting debate. But I'm, I'm not an abolitionist or anything, but I, I think it's important to underscore, especially for anyone in the room who is not in the K-12 world of education, that the release of ChatGPT last year was nothing short of an asteroid in education. And whatever its ultimate merits, and I, I believe there are possibly many merits, and, and it can enhance learning and teaching in many ways, the way in which it was released, and the fact that most people were thoroughly unprepared for it, um, could only be described as a kind of cataclysm. So it's not just that cheating is on the rise, it's that 
everything about what teachers thought they were doing in education, especially in these subjects like mine, the humanities, that are so dependent on linguistic expression and so subjective and unverifiable in some of the ways that other forms of assessment are verifiable, um, they had to adapt with nothing to go on. And furthermore, teachers are already in a pretty difficult position, in, in case you weren't aware of that. And furthermore, we just had this thing called COVID and the pandemic, and they had to learn how to teach online. They had to learn how to assess online. They've had it really rough. So point number one is sympathy for teachers. But what I really want to push on here is why, what is it that we are valuing when we say that cheating is on the rise and this is a problem? So I'm not going to, no pun intended, say anything very original here. Uh, but what's wrong with cheating is you know, easily distilled into a few obvious intuitions, students don't learn what they're supposed to. So it's supposed to be not good for the students who, who haven't mastered the material, haven't acquired the skills that they're supposed to acquire if they cheat because they're taking shortcuts, they're not doing the actual mental work and yielding the actual mental outcomes that we want them to. Um, and I think this is right, and I think that we should have a notion of cheating, but notice that even saying it this way presupposes certain aims of education and certain conceptions of learning. So to say that students haven't learned what they're supposed to, you already have to know what they're supposed to learn. You, to, in my mind, I think you should have an account of why that is correct or why that is valuable. You should be able to defend it against other conceptions of what they should learn, other conceptions of what the aims of education are on which there's been much ink spilled. So this is you know, far from a settled matter. And if they're not learning what they're supposed to, we're supposed to worry about that because there's something intrinsically good about them learning what they're supposed to, whatever that may be. It also presupposes some conceptions of learning. So we think if they're cheating, or cheating in certain ways, like paying someone to write an essay for them, then they're not learning. Well, we, that's debatable too. What does it mean to learn? What is it that we want them to learn? Might they be learning other things that we've overlooked? Um, another important ethical consideration, and I'm, I'm, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but maybe sort of the two main points about cheating, is that it's not fair to other students, unfair advantage. Um, again, I think this is intuitive and ethically important, and it's a category we need to retain in some way, but what does it mean to say that it's not fair to other students? Again, that's going to be quite contextual. It'll depend, among other things, on what is available to the other students and how the other students behave with what is available to them as well as the capacity of the instructor or the institution to sort of track the cheating or remedy it once it's been discovered. So I'm going to propose that um, intuitively why we call something not cheating is that we are trading on a kind of undefended investment in the value of originality. And I'm going to explore this a little bit in this presentation and just probe a few different ways that originality fails us or doesn't, isn't exactly what it seems to be in order to ultimately conclude that it's not a good enough proxy for whether something counts as cheating or not, and the advent of LLMs is surely only going to complicate this. So originality can mean numerically distinct from what already exists. Um, we can write a sentence that has never been written before with particular words in a particular order that has never appeared before. We can write a string of numbers that has never been written before. These are numerically distinct events. Whether they are worthwhile, whether they are even meaningful, is anyone's guess. There's nothing inherently good or inherently meaningful or inherently knowledge advancing about creating something original in this sense. But we've often used this at least as an entry to understanding what is wrong with plagiarism or with material that has not been generated in a numerically distinct way. Um, if somebody, like an academic, writes something that's distinct, at least we know it hasn't been plagiarized because it didn't exist before. ChatGPT has already upended that as any kind of criterion for what we might value about originality because as this website, which notice I'm giving credit to, I'm not plagiarizing, says, what ChatGPT creates is an original work each time you ask it. And th this is one of the ways in which it, it feels more threatening to average educators than existing tools like Wikipedia, where students could certainly go and get information and copy it and, and pass it off as their own, but you could locate it. It, it was not a numerically distinct uh, website. 
So as you know, it creates something new every time you ask, and its responses are not in the databases of plagiarism checkers. So numerical distinctiveness is not enough of a criterion. Another sense of originality, and I think the one that we mean more so when we talk about assessment and academic integrity as a value, is that something has issued from a unique creative mind. Or if I may just sort of translate the language of LLMs and AI into the more human realm, it's like the mind is the generator. It's been generated not by a computer generator, but by what we imagine or impute to somebody's head. Um, and this is widely understood, and this is, again, the baseline against which many assessments of LLMs like ChatGPT are being leveraged. Like in this article in the New York Times, Kevin Roos, and, and I thought it was a very insightful article, but I just want to pick on an assumption here, says that the basic, it, that uh, originality is the basic principle that the work students turn in should reflect cogitation happening inside their brains. So in that sense, it doesn't even matter, or it doesn't have to be numerically distinct. Um, you know, statistically, it's possible that two people on separate islands could come up with the same thing. In fact, I think that was one of the topics in the, <laughs> in the last panel, you know, how many people figure out calculus at the same time without talking to each other, how many people figure out the light bulb at the same time without talking to each other. So in that sense, it's not that it's um, a unique event, it's that it issues from processes that are proper to the thinker or the mind that is supposed to be doing the thinking. Um, so I think educators at all levels and especially um, in the humanities where we rely a lot on text-based assessment are taking these things mostly for granted and I think they are standing on a very long and well-established tradition of modern Western European ideals such as individuality, rationality, and autonomy, which again, I am not here to disparage, although I would like to point out some of their limits and how relying on them as a proxy is only going to get us into deeper trouble. So, uh, in, in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be sort of pointing out some of the ways that originality is more complicated than this unreflective intuition uh, lets, lets it on. Um, and as I just said, a lot of the values that originality presupposes that we don't pause to defend each time we refer to originality are very Western values. So even the notion of plagiarism as such, that when you copy and paste words from another source, you have to, as I did on the previous slide, use quotation marks and provide a source, is, as I imagine many of you, at least in the university, already know, a kind of random Western conceit that is not shared internationally and emerges from culturally and historically contingent processes, so that in fact the more international our education, our higher education becomes, the more we learn that plagiarism is, is not even this bare minimum no-no that we think it is in North America, especially in East Asian and collectivist cultures, um, as this article from Study International suggests, plagia what? Um, plagiarism doesn't register, or at least it doesn't register in the, in the same kind of academically um, unacceptable way that it registers here, because a large part of that tradition is uh, copying without direct attribution as a means of showing respect for and learning from masters, learning from people who had essentially earned the right to say something original, um, who had enough depth and enough respect to generate their own new ideas. Students would then be copying them rather than trying to generate their own ideas. Now, even in the West, um, there are problems with our reliance on originality to distinguish what is properly the student's work from what is the work of an inadmissible outside influence. And I think that technology has often been framed as like, the inadmissible outside influence par excellence, so that again, in Ditch That Textbook on the website, it says, if we close up the computers and ask students to write something on paper, we know it's being generated by their own brains. I think that's a generalization. It's not totally off base, but it's worth pausing to think about what we mean by this. Why is it that writing with a pen and paper is so much more admissible than writing with the assistance of technology once we understand the way that the mind actually works. 
Um, to quote Mark Twain here, I don't know for sure if Mark Twain said this, but it's certainly eminently quotable. There is no such thing as a new idea. It is impossible. We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and we make new and curious combinations. He said this uh, without the, the benefit of doing computer science, um, but my understanding is that a huge amount of scientific research since Mark Twain has essentially corroborated this, that the way that the human brain works and the way that we've been able to train non-human uh, intelligences to do things that resemble human intelligence is by uh, recombining and filtering lots and lots of data and finding patterns. So if that's the case, then even the student sitting at the desk with a pencil and a notebook is not inventing something new ex nihilo. She is not writing something that has no traceable origins in anything else she's encountered, on the contrary. In fact, our assessment already assumes that because part of what we assess when we read essays is the, their kind of fidelity to the spirit, if not the letter, of what we've assigned them to read. They have to sort of faithfully demonstrate an understanding of other people's words and ideas. So if they were doing it ex nihilo, you know, we probably wouldn't reward them very much anyway. And yet we think of that pen and paper model as sort of ontologically distinct from being influenced by interactions with uh, computer or non-human intelligence. Um, there's also the fact that even when people swear up and down that they've discovered something entirely by themselves or written something completely out of their own mind, again, science has, has shown us that this is not always accurate. Um, I experienced this phenomenon before I knew there was a name for it. I was, I was kind of sadistically delighted to find out that there was a name for it. You know when you read, say, a bunch of things by someone who writes in a different style from you, and the next time you go to write something, you go, oh, I'm using a strange word order. I don't think I've ever used that phrase before. And really, it only takes a little bit of thought and a little bit of honesty with yourself to realize that you've been primed by something that you read, which is all well within the, the, the rubric of kosher academic scholarship, right? This, this doesn't transcend anything like cheating in normal academic terms as long as you attribute things. But there have even been cases where academics or journalists have been called out because somebody actually ran it through a search engine and found that there were unattributed quotes. And I believe that in some cases, the author sincerely didn't know that they had unconsciously copied a string of words or something from somewhere else because cryptomnesia, there's your word for the day. Um, there's also a contradiction even within our own education. There are many contradictions. Don't get me started with our own education system. But as much as I am, am trying to point out the ways that we unconsciously and without adequate justification emphasize individuality and originality as the benchmark against which cheating shows up, there's a huge emphasis in the younger grades especially on collaborative learning, on group work, or on what I think we might just want to call collective originality. The group is still supposed to come up with a project, you know, their, their skit or their presentation or something, which is novel. They are still supposed to not just copy off of YouTube, but they're supposed to do it in this sort of mysterious collaborative way that, you know, on the one hand, like, promotes constructivist and child-centered progressive pedagogies and seems to align with some things we know about ed psych, about how people learn, and it's all very good. And at the same time, we assign individual grades to each student, and we really want to know what's going on in each of the students' individual minds, and we don't want them to become an undifferentiable blur. So we're trying to have it both ways, and there is truth to both, but it just goes to show that originality is usually thought to be the generative activity of a single mind, except in cases when it's not. And then we actually, even again in our Western worldview, promote um, generativity of multiple minds. And if you want to get into, if you want to hear a good rant, ask a grade six teacher how they grade group assignments. And even in the West, of course, we have our own, our own domains in which originality is consciously devalued and where the act of learning and of demonstrating that learning has occurred, demonstrating mastery of the relevant knowledge or skills or what have you, is predicated precisely on not being original but on copying. So the great art masters, you know, like 
Vermeer and Rembrandt, you know, famously had their students copy their work and that was regarded as the proper way of learning to paint because they were the masters. And we still bend over backwards and, and people travel to the ends of the earth trying to figure out if a given painting was painted by the master or a student because we care about its authenticity and in a way, the better the copy, the more the authenticity matters. So we are depending on originality as the product, as, as like I said, the sort of creative product of a unique mind, as well as encouraging um, people to do the opposite of that as a means of learning. So education may come apart from other forms of production when it comes to the value or type of originality that we're looking for. Um, I'm just going to point out one final. This is, these aren't even really a list of examples. These are just more um, things that require further thought. Last one I'll point out, which is obviously rampant in higher education already, is that because we are working in multiple natural languages, even aside from computer languages, we've already encountered um, divergent intuitions about what counts as cheating or what counts as academic integrity when moving between languages. And that is obviously, again, only going to get more and more complicated. Google Translate, for one, had already upended a, a huge segment of how we interpret and assess academic work across languages. So I'll give you a, one example from a course I taught last year. Um, we. There are students who translate sources, or there are people who translate sources because, say, an English translation isn't available. And I'm usually okay with that. Like, if they're reading a source in Chinese, and I don't read Chinese, and they're translating it and saying it's my translation, if the rest of the paper looks okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much gonna be okay with that. And of course, now I can go Google Translate and maybe try it out myself. Um, I had a student who literally did not know that she might be doing something amiss, when she wrote her entire text in Chinese and fed her text, or this is what she said she did, I have no way of verifying it, fed it into a translator and gave me what ended up being a very awkward English essay. Um, and this is also, uh, there's also the phenomenon of bilingual plagiarism, which is, which is known among academics, where um, a paper is passed off as something new when it's really just a translation of something that was written in another language that it's assumed most people won't know how to translate. So where are the benchmarks here? Obviously, there are degrees of borrowing and crediting or not crediting the process through which the text was generated. Um, and they may not all be morally equivalent. They may not all have the equivalent status in terms of academic integrity. But we are certainly moving toward a world in which the mixing and translation between natural languages is severely problematizing our a priori judgments about what counts as original. Because everything I previously said about what teachers are looking for and what counts as original, that's all within a single natural language, and it's already a mess. Um, and now we have to think much more broadly than that. So I, we can say more about that later, but I'll, I'll leave that point there. So just to conclude here, am I saying that <laughs> We don't have to worry about cheating, no. <laughs> Again, huge amount of sympathy for the teachers and their job, as well as a real ethical investment in being able to meaningfully distinguish between the kind of learning and the kind of outputs we want from students and the kind of learning and the kind of outputs that are not desired and perhaps even detrimental. We have to be able to think about these lines in an ongoing way, but because of all these factors amplified by LLMs, those lines are moving. And we can't just rely on these sort of facile proxies for academic integrity or cheating like I'm suggesting originality has functioned. So to go back to what I said earlier was wrong with cheating, students don't learn what they're supposed to. I think it is still a problem if students don't learn what they're supposed to, but I think it's not at all obvious what students are supposed to learn. Obviously, there's a huge amount of discussion about this now. Oh, we shouldn't be teaching them to write grammatical sentences because any old engine can write a grammatical sentence for them. We shouldn't, just like with the calculator, we don't have to teach them how to add numbers. We have to teach them to understand numbers and then they can outsource the arithmetic processes to the calculator. Um, so there's a lot more that can be said about that. I imagine some of our discussion will get into you know, what, what we do and don't want them to learn and who decides. Um, I don't have answers to that, but I will just say for now that I don't think originality is always a good proxy 
for what we want them to learn or a good way of deciding whether they have learned what we want them to learn. There could be ways in which um, they are learning something very valuable that is not original or they are doing something original that is actually not very valuable. Uh, likewise, I said cheating is wrong because it's not fair to other students. I think this is actually extra important now because of the ways that a lot of technological advancements and, and pedagogical disparities exacerbate existing inequities among students and that we still attach a lot of lifetime opportunities to educational outcomes. So I think we have to be extremely vigilant about this, that it's fair, but what does that mean? I don't think originality is um, a good proxy either for whether students have done something that is inherently fair to other students. Um, it's not unfair, for example, if everyone is using LLMs or handing in essays that were written by LLMs. They may be not the essays you want them to be, but it's not inherently unfair because everybody is doing that. Fairness depends on, among other things, how they're being assessed and what we want them to learn and what kinds of rewards or opportunities are attached to whatever those outcomes are. So LLMs have simply thrown into disarray so many of our longstanding, I would say mostly well-intentioned, mostly like enlightenment-based progressive values in education, um, thrown them into disarray and uh, we need to pause, we need to give teachers a bit of a break and we need to start sussing out what it is that really matters to us in student learning and student assessment. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So, uh, the future of education. So, my name is Paolo Granata, and uh, well, um, I'm not a data scientist, I'm a media historian, so I take things from a historical perspective first. And, um, and I'm Italian. I've been teaching at the University of Bologna for 15 years. That's why I speak English uh, with a perfect Italian accent. And I could not bring a reference to my alma mater, the University of Bologna. This is a representation, a 15th century representation, 14th century representation of the medieval university. So speaking of the actual uh, uh, story of uh, education, uh, uh, there is always a continuity rather than change. For centuries, higher education didn't change so much. So we still today have a professor speaking, usually a teaching assistant on the left watching at the professor. So, so the best students on the first row, a couple of students on top whispering each other, and a student taking a nap. <laughs> so uh, academic institutions are led by conservatism rather than uh, disruption. So it took a global pandemic and ChatGPT to move from here to here. So guess who is the student with camera off? The one who was taking a nap. So in, in, in ChatGPT as well, uh, was a kind of a disruption. So. Uh, Laura, uh, you, you were mentioning about uh, the asteroid, right? So, like, well, the asteroid may lead to the extinction, right? Uh, I had a, a different, uh, a couple of different examples. Firstly, the actual, uh, well, in the 70s, uh, in the 70s, uh, math teachers started complaining about the advent of calculators in math classes and uh, claiming that the use of calculators uh, uh, may entirely disrupt uh, the, the way students may teach, uh, may, may learn mathematics. Um, and said so this is something more uh, recent, the French university banning uh, students from using ChatGPT. So we see that was a first reaction to the ChatGPT asteroid, but I have another example for them. And uh, the college essay is that. So there was another claiming, right? So circulating in higher education institutions uh, until, until uh, actual uh, uh, academic uh, used the ChatGPT to write a reference, a letter, a letter a recommendation. So uh, when they realized that there were possible usages of the same technology. And so uh, the asteroid, it was a disruption. But I have another example. This is the monolith. So this, I think uh, this is how 
we uh, uh, welcome the ChatGPT in higher education. So like the monolith, we were like this tribe of uh, uh, apes, right? November the 30th in 2022, when ChatGPT 3 was launched globally, it became a kind of mainstream. So it was a kind of magic. So any sufficiently advanced technology is a form of magic. This is absolutely, I think, um, uh, irrelevant. And then we started using ChatGPT. So that's another, I think, uh, uh, particular relevant uh, thing. So a tool, uh, a new instrument, a way for empowering uh, uh, language in different, uh, in different uh, modalities. And uh, speaking of collective intelligence, or uh, you say the collective originality, right? Uh, we actually have the same quote by Mark Twain. Well, not the same quote, the same author. To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, um, well, except for my sister, she's a judge. She uses a hammer to send people to jail. So that's relevant. There are symbolic uses of technologies that may be relevant to our humanity. Secondly, uh, there are intrinsic uh, characteristics that are uh, um, connaturated, that are embedded into any technology. Um, there is a systemic change introduced by any technology. And, uh, and again, so I was wondering to a man or a woman or a, an educator with ChatGPT, right? Everything looks like. Uh, maybe plagiarism or maybe uh, potentialities that we can export together. And so we started exploring um, ChatGPT, the potentialities of this uh, new tool. Well, it was funny that uh, the actual uh, first question is, uh, are you a robot? And uh, so I thought that proving that we are human means uh, um, love, care, uh, care for others. Uh, no, no, we had to select the traffic lights to prove that we are human. A kind of Turing test in reverse. And well, I think there is something here we can reflect on the fact that uh, uh, the risk is not that robots are uh, becoming human beings, but the opposite, that human beings uh, may become uh, robots in a kind of standardized way, standardizing knowledge, standardizing the way we, we conceive uh, uh, our uh, role of education. So the, um, well, actually, Speaking of extinctions, um, I actually have a good news. And uh, the good news is that, uh, again, we need to uh, avoid uh, the extinction, not of the entire humanity, but the extinction of our humanity. So taking and bringing uh, what makes us uh, human in an age of AI. And so the good news is that, uh, to many extent, uh, I borrow here an, in, an insight from um, Oxford um, philosopher Luciano Floridi, that describing AI and ChatGPT in particular, um, language, language larger models, like uh, agire sin intelligere, acting without uh, knowing. This is pretty much uh, the case. A kind of action that is embedded into the machine, so undertaking some tasks without the actual intelligence in it. And so in the field of education, I think uh, uh, we can conceive this uh, acting without uh, uh, knowing. And so we can uh, better reflect uh, what's the meaning of artificial intelligence, which we know it's a, it's a weird label. It's, it really doesn't represent what's, uh, what's, in, uh, what's in there. I like to propose the idea of an augmented intelligence. So um, and AI is here to enhance our thinking, not to replace it and enhance the way we can teach, enhance the learning process, not to replace us, not to, again, simulate it in a kind of artificial way. So the idea of augmenting, extending, expanding the human faculties is something that is a part of any technology. As a media historian, so if we look back at the history of humankind and media, like uh, the invention of language, uh, writing, uh, books, uh, printing press, uh, uh, televisions, so all media to some extent, uh, like Marshall McLuhan used to say, that there are extensions 
of some human faculties and so uh, some uh, uh, cognitive faculties as well. So we are extending, we have a means for extending, augmenting, expanding what makes us human. And so for instance, ChatGPT is teaching us a very important point, that to make uh, the right questions. So to focus on the quality uh, uh, questions. And uh, of course, uh, we can uh, foster the sense of questioning as a strategic means for, uh, for learning for boosting the way of uh, fostering critical learning, making the right questions. The DAO is even more important than just receiving answers. Uh, another, I think, um, important component in embracing AI in education, in particular the uh, chat GPT, is the uh, dialogic nature of learning. So we engage in a dialogue, we engage in a conversation, by making the right questions, by making the dialogue, we learn, we uh, engage in a, a meaningful process. And the, the Greek word there is the uh, maieutics, uh, my, the Socratic maieutics, that literally means the midwives uh, that give uh, ideas uh, life, right? That, that help uh, ideas uh, born, right? So the idea of engaging in a dialogue and dialogue as the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental course of uh, uh, learning. And because in, in dialogue and conversation, we uh, grow together. And so a few points I wanted to um, highlight uh, for uh, conceiving the future of education. So firstly, the idea that uh, uh, ChatGPT AI is not just a tool, a service, a product, it's an environment. It's an ecosystem. It is uh, the actual uh, water we swim in. It's all around us. It's embracing, it's immersive. So we did this mistake with the uh, internet, for instance, back in the 90s. We thought it was just a service, just a tool, not the entire environment that was going to shape the human affairs at all. And so, a large. And so, uh, like water, so uh, AI is the, is the new medium we, within which we are immersed, within which uh, uh, we uh, are undertaking our, our, our daily lives. And that's a, a, an important point, I think. Again, going beyond the idea of conceiving technologies as tools and conceiving them as the environments within which we live. There is a way of saying nowadays, it's pretty much a circulating like a, a collective uh, uh, form of originality. That is uh, the idea that, uh, again, you know, uh, to overcome, of course, uh, the narrative of the, uh, the false narrative of replacement. Okay, no, no, don't be worried. AI is not going to uh, uh, steal your, uh, your job. Uh, someone else using AI will or may do it. So uh, this is important, I think, to avoid the risk of adopting that kind of ludite-like narrative of job losses and job uh, displacements. And uh, the effects of AI are uh, far from deterministic. They are uh, um, ecosystemic, they are ecological, they operate within a, a multifaced uh, and dynamic system that uh, interacts within uh, and co-evolves uh, alongside the human societies. And so uh, I think uh, from uh, approaching the, from an ecological perspective, this uh, false uh, narrative of the replacement, uh, the key is AI literacy. AI literacy is the key. It's the idea of understanding this new environment we live in. It's the idea that uh, the future of education will not only uh, uh, involve incorporating AI, learning how to use AI tools, but the understanding will involve the understanding of uh, how this new environment uh, shapes and changes our uh, pedagogical landscape and uh, reshaping uh, the educational strategies, reshaping the way we conceive uh, this kind of uh, epistemic shift we are uh, witnessing nowadays. So the, a very epistemic shift, so the way we know what we know. And so a few things uh, I learned, uh, particularly during the pandemic and also in response of my uh, experimentation and doing with the uh, AI tool uh, in, in, in the classroom. So 
AI literacy is a key to even uh, respond to the concerns uh, about uh, cheating, uh, using cheat GPT. So AI literacy as a way to uh, foster a, a, a awareness about the potential implications of this technology. So a thing I learned is that uh, a fundamental shift, a pedagogical shift that ChatGPT can help us undertake is the shift from the content to the context. Uh, ChatGPT can be a good content generator. Uh, to some extent, uh, with a, um, a prompt engineering, uh, with the right uh, uh, ways of uh, using it, uh, it, it can provide the right content. And this is not all about education. Education is not all about content providers. So as educators, we are not just content providers. As educators, we are not just uh, uh, giving good content. So I always say to my students, oh, why, why, why you should pay tuitions uh, to get good contents uh, at the university? So you can get good contents uh, in a good book, uh, in a good documentary. The real value of an academic institution is to provide the context. Content is important, but the context more so. It's our role as educators to create the right context, set the right context within which learning takes place, within which connections take place, within which knowledge takes the form of the ability of contextualize, going beyond the spatialization. Specialization is important, but particularly in an age of AI, being able to build the broader picture, be, being able to build the connections, and so to reconstruct the whole content, that kind of a holistic knowledge is part of what ChatGPT is forcing us uh, to do. Preparing our students, individuals, to navigate uh, the, the complexities of the overall context, not just the, the, the content. And so I think as a pedagogical shift, so from content to context. Another thing I learned uh, is that uh, we are uh, forced to rethink the very role of educators and the very role of the students in this chat GPT setting in the classroom. So um, rethinking those roles, for instance, uh, as an educator, I feel that now I'm more than ever empowered not only to design the context, but to design the experience. Uh, I feel like uh, the educator is an experience designer, where contents are available in, 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 a, in a setting where uh, uh, the content is, is there. In this evolving landscape, we are not just a mere uh, the, the knowledge givers, knowledge uh, providers or content providers. So the idea of designing the learning experience, designing a kind of integrated learning experience, we are, and I feel, like a facilitators in response to the disruption generated by ChatGPT, a facilitator, an interface between uh, a realm of knowledge and uh, my students. And, this is, again, the idea of conceiving uh, the um, educator as an experience designer. An epistemic shift in the way we know what we know. An epistemic shift in the way we conceive uh, learning as a process and teaching as an experience uh, that involves uh, students. And there is something circulating in the, in the media there. It's, uh, hey, ChatGPT finished this building. Right? I think that is clever. There is something clever here. There are some uh, uh, capabilities, there are some conditions that are entirely human. And uh, in, in, uh, in the way we undertake uh, our uh, uh, teaching and learning processes, uh, there must be the human agency that really and still counts in the way we facilitate this process. Uh, reflecting on what we can do as educators that ChatGPT cannot do. Reflecting on uh, rethinking the role of educators in light of this kind of disruption. So with all these assumptions, uh, essentially, I wanted to again foster AI literacy in my students, 
to rethink the way we conceive uh, educators uh, and our role as educators. Many raised their hands uh, when uh, Ashton was there in the, the question. Rethink the role of the students that are now more than ever uh, invited to be active, proactive, to be part of the learning process, to, to play a strategic role in the learning process. This is nothing new for educators, so, but we have a, an opportunity and chance now to retrieve that kind of pedagogical foundations in light of the changes generated by ChatGPT. And so putting together these ideas, rethinking the role of the educator, rethinking the role of the students, and, uh, and reimagining the uh, classroom context and setting, uh, with all these assumptions, I came up with the idea of uh, creating a, a course, uh, um, AI as a classroom, that is pretty much mostly entirely taught by AI tools. So this is not a class AI-centered, so it's a student-centered, as I told you. I like to empower my students and uh, have them being part in a, an active way, in a proactive way of this uh, experiential, uh, uh, let's say, experimental class. I'm uh, uh, changing my role as an educator. I will not show up in class. So, well, I'm not putting myself out of job. However, I'm rethinking my role. I'm rethinking my role as a designer, as the facilitator for this class, as the person that uh, uh, designs and uh, decides what kind of tools, what kind of uh, uh, means, opportunities the students will, will receive in this active and proactive approach I'm, uh, I'm requiring. We're also creating, maybe later I'll tell you more, but we are creating different personas. This is just one example and the different AI personas to differentiate the teaching modalities and possibilities. And so we are experimenting to some extent to humanize AI, but also differentiate the actual personas of the AI instructor. We are building our own data sets, our own ChatGPT trained on a specific data set in media studies to foster the idea of a a data set that is uh, narrowed down to a specific field of knowledge. And I think that may be uh, the future of education because you have a large data set uh, where you can engage in a dialogical way, but also the future of publishing. Imagine publishing a book, a textbook, or a book on any subject, and then providing along with the book, uh, the chat bot or the chat book so essentially being able to interact in a dialogue, in conversation, with the same content, the, the same 500-page the same textbook about an introductory uh, discipline or course uh, by a very ac accountable uh, publisher like Oxford University Press. Imagine turning a textbook into a chat book so where students can engage in a dialogue, in conversation, and asking to elaborate, to explain, to refer. So that opens up to possibilities. Where again, the professor is not put aside, is not replaced by AI, but the professor takes a, 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 a broader role as an experienced designer, as a contextual designer, and students will, uh, will, will, will come to, uh, I think, understanding the idea of how important is self-assessment, self-learning, learning how to learn, learning how to cope with changes, and, uh, and not just relying on uh, uh, maybe grades, uh, maybe marks, uh, and so the, the, the idea that learning is a human process, that can elevate our, our spirit. Uh, with that said, um, uh, I was just uh, going to mention two important resources that uh, I think uh, uh, educators particularly and policymakers in the field of education may take into account. Uh, UNESCO uh, released recently a AI and education uh, guide uh, for uh, uh, policymakers, uh, guidance for policymakers, and also on the right, even recently, the chat GPT and artificial intelligence in higher edu education. A quick start guide. There are many 
uh, good pieces of, of, of advice to navigate the change, but also to better understand, uh, as I told you, the new media ecology, the new environmental settings within which we can understand the change and possibly the future of education in an age of AI. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lauren and Paolo. Um, I have some questions here, and we're going to open it up to discussion uh, to the audience soon. Um, but I just want to start off uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple of simple questions. Uh, the first is, how do you see LLMs as being different from traditional educational tools? So from the educator's point of view, do you see this as a revolutionary advance, or is this kind of an extension? I mean, obviously a large extension, but um, do you see this as kind of a different way of doing largely the same things as educators, or are we going to have to completely reimagine the experiences that we're designing? So, Paolo, maybe I'll let you answer that first, because you just talked about designing experiences in this new classroom that you're... That yeah, you're no, without, yeah. Uh, without repeating myself in the way that uh, yeah. uh, definitely we have a chance for uh, rethinking our role uh, as, um, as educators. Mm, we are... Um, I think in a moment where experimentation is fundamental. So that's why I wanted to start this uh, experimental class. If not now, if not uh, us as a university, right? Who should uh, uh, experiment on this kind of uh, uh, new pedagogies and new uh, methodologies for uh, embracing in a critical way, even raising uh, the ethical uh, concerns and issues, right, in the experiments. But experimentation and, and I would say exploration, so the, the curiosity that uh, uh, drives uh, my, my approach in this is the, the actual um, way of exploring what's going on in, in a very tangible way, in a very empirical way, practical way. Uh, I'm, I'm teaming up with, for this class on AI with startups in the Silicon Valley. There's a startup uh, mostly working on uh, a kind of um, um, responsive teaching based on uh, the assessment of students' knowledge. And so the idea that uh, the ChatGPT professor will uh, do what the ideal professor should do. So based on the actual needs of each single student, right, uh, responding accordingly, right, and generating the right uh, contents based on the... So we're teaming up with startups, uh, we are um, testing other tools, so we are creating our own chat GPT on a specific thing, so maybe later, if there is time, I'll tell you more. Firstly, experimentation. Don't fear to experiment. So we need to be scared of experimenting now. I think is the is the right moment. And secondly, to um, allow students uh, not just to use it, but allow students to critically understand. So to f well foster a critical understanding. The, the idea the idea of a literacy is not just okay. I need to learn how to do prompt engineering. I need to learn how to maybe cast uh, the, the prompt uh, in order to bypass the academic integrity detector or something like this. Of course, uh, that, may, that may be a temptation. But the, by literacy, I mean understanding uh, the overall impact uh, of this technology in society, understanding the overall impact uh, in, uh, in, in, in our epistemology. I really believe in this word. So how do we know what we know? So how do we get to know something? So what do we mean by knowing? So the, the same questions you did about plagiarism and cheating are actually fundamental questions about, again, what do we mean by knowledge? What do we mean by uh, uh, using tools for fostering the sense of uh, uh, overall understanding of the world we live in? And so I think from an epistemological uh, standpoint, but also from a very practical and uh, uh, experimental standpoint, we are living a very interesting time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Lauren, do you have an answer to that? Sure. So, of course, a lot of my remarks were intended to illustrate some of the continuity between um, these new LLMs and maybe existing problems with or limitations on our earlier conceptions of learning and academic integrity that we didn't recognize as such. So I'm very much on the one hand, interested in the ways that things like ChatGPT are not 
new and different in kind, maybe only in degree. At the same time, I do actually think that we have to be attentive to some of the major differences of a qualitative nature, not just degree. And, um, and I think that's related to things like the limits of AI literacy, which I, I might have more to say on, but um, th that's my short answer. Okay, sure. Um, do you have examples of those differences in kind that, uh, in mind? So I, um, I think that essentially those, those kind of modern Western goals and the progressive aims of education that I referred to are, remain essentially the right ones. And when executed um, in, in the optimal way, they do help us to figure out who is learning, whose mind is growing, and to enjoy the fruits of actual human thought and human growth. In other words, we need to continue to stress literacy, standard literacy, using language expressively, using language grammatically, using language to translate uh, things that are intangible into something that is more symbolically recognizable. We need to continue to emphasize critical thinking. And I think a lot of the response to incursions into the traditional classroom, um, up to and including ChatGPT, have been, well, we just need more critical thinking. Um, now, I think critical thinking is, again, what, what we should aspire to for all sorts of reasons, but I think it's naive in the face of such intelligence and in the face of such potential psychological manipulation to think that any of us, let alone students, can sort of use critical thinking to overcome or to um, outsmart what AI is doing that may be different from what humans are doing. I think there's so many examples of us being taken in by false or misleading information. I think the rampant rise in conspiracy theories and polarization and so on can easily be traced to um, this, you know, the, the fact that we've been outsmarted by algorithms and our minds just aren't really sophisticated enough as much as we tout the virtues of critical thinking to resist the kinds of you know decoys that the algorithms throw at us and ironically like the people on the alt right might say well you liberals have always talked about critical thinking we're the most critical thinkers out there we criticize everything we don't trust <laughs> anyone we know that anything could be a fake and i mean they're not wrong like we're all susceptible to that like you use chat gpt and it will cite made up sources and maybe that'll change. I know that it's getting better all the time, and maybe those things will, will come out in the wash, but then other things will crop up, I'm right. sure. Like I said, I'm not on the computer side of it, but I mean, psychologically, we just know we're, as soon as we see the quotation marks and the citation, as academics, we're like, it's legit. <laughs> we're so gullible. <laughs> and so, as much as, as I think we should be doubling down on sort of traditional progressive goals in education um, and critical thinking, literacy writ large, tech literacy, um, media literacy. I've done a lot of work on sex education. Now we talk about porn literacy. You're not gonna beat porn. Like censorship is not the answer. Right. I'm not an abolitionist. I definitely don't believe in censorship. <laughs> so you have to teach kids to be porn literate. But porn is still shaping their brains and their desires in ways that they can't possibly fathom or overcome. I still think literacy is important. It's just, it's not going to penetrate all the way through our psychology because we're dealing with something that I do think is fundamentally different mm -hmm. from other kinds of incursions into our learning processes. So I guess the surprise analogy of the day would be like porn literacy and chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, wow. Yeah, I think, okay, we ticked the uh, Jillian's box of hearing something we'd never heard before. So thank you. Thank Original. You so much. Yeah, that's right. You heard it here first. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Um, Lauren, one of the things that I was most fascinated by in your talk was your um, just comments about the impacts on Western versus Eastern students. Um, so I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that. Like, what, if you can uh, speculate on, to, on about LLM's impact on Western students versus Eastern students? That's a very hard question to answer, um, but, I, but I think I can say something just more general about it. It's an example of how all of our educational institutions and protocols and assumptions come from somewhere. And we have successfully adapted to a number of technological changes as well as a certain degree of globalization and intercultural exchange without really giving up on most of the fundamental assumptions about what a university is or what an essay is or what we should be grading high school students on and things like that. But I think we might be reaching a point where push comes to shove and the 
contrast between Western notions of academic integrity and, as an example, Chinese notions of academic performance is just a case in point that is probably being brought to a head because of the technological advances. Everything we assume about the classrooms and the curriculum and assessment and the role of language in learning and whether human thought is supposed to be original and whether human thought can be assessed in a verbal form, like all these things are debatable to say the least. And I think we can sort of double down and try to, try to just shoehorn everything into our old paradigms but sooner or later we will recognize it could have been otherwise and maybe it would be better if it were otherwise. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that there's a, you know, it would be better if we didn't have a notion of academic integrity or that we understood learning ideas the way that a Confucian would. Mm -hmm. um, but just knowing that that distinction exists should already give us pause. Amazing, thank you. Um, Okay, so my next question is to Paolo, largely. Uh, Lauren, you can weigh in if you want. Um, but you talked a lot about, at the end, like designing, like ed education as designing experiences for people to learn in, which I love that uh, analogy. Um, and if AI is largely going to be the water that we're all swimming in as students, um, you know, how can we take a proactive role in designing that? that experience kind of as well as possible for students like what you mentioned a lot about kind of experimenting and so on um but you know uh, and not just um not just like educators but all the stakeholders that you can think of like what should we do now in order to kind of make that water as safe as possible to this women absolutely so uh, on a practical way, rethinking um, assignments, I think it's fundamental. So rethinking and make the assignment mirror and fulfill the sense of new approaches in learning, uh, new approaches in designing the learning experience. So uh, overcoming um, some um, um, standard practices in higher education, particularly I will say in the Western world, that are based on um, written assignments, that are based on uh, uh, compiling uh, the most possible uh, uh, piece of writing uh, that uh, fulfills what's in the rubric, what's uh, uh, the, the conceived as the standard um, paper or whatever. So I think uh, rethinking means uh, even uh, going beyond those kind of standardized practices. And uh, learning is not all about uh, writing assignments, for instance. I think uh, in response to the possibility of using ChatGPT for writing texts of all kinds, I think we will, uh, we will see a, a coming back of some forms of orality. The ability to verbally express, the ability to verbally elaborate the ability to uh, conceptualize something that is a, a verbal, that has a verbal outcome. And, well, I'm, I'm not saying that we should retrieve the oral exams as a way, so some colleagues says, okay, let's go back to the oral exams in person, uh, so no, no. But there is, something, uh, there is something here important. So for any technology, there are always uh, some kind of... Uh, unintended consequences, unexpected consequences, even in a positive way. I think uh, ChatGPT is bringing back uh, the necessity of being able to elaborate verbally, being able to, uh, so in a classroom setting, uh, like many colleagues already do, fostering not just discussion, uh, the, the, not, I don't mean just the in-class discussion, but the idea that uh, uh, in order to uh, take the most of your learning and your knowledge, you have to be able to elaborate. So art, uh, the art of rhetoric, uh, the art of uh, uh, um, verbal communication are coming back, uh, I think, in high demand, uh, particularly in, in response uh, to the ChatGPT uh, revolution, let's call it this way. And so that's why in the classroom, all these, um, uh, I think, uh, nuances should be um, revitalized. 
in order to really make the classroom an experimental place for, uh, again, letting students uh, verbalize uh, in a different way than uh, the usual in-class discussion, or letting students uh, going beyond the standard uh, research paper that has been uh, that standard. So when uh, you were mentioning about the, the fact that uh, there are forms uh, in writing, in assignments, there are there's a kind of collective knowledge uh, that is already there. And so sometimes we do, like in the Renaissance times or in the painters, we do replicate what's already a standard. That has been the case, I think, uh, particularly in the Western educational institutions, uh, to standardize. A standard is very high, but still a standard. So that's why I feel uh, it's time for tomorrow we're going to have a panel on creativity in the AI. It's time to rethink the things, uh, rethink the assignment, uh, foster creativity as a way to, for learning. Design thinking, I'm personally a big fan of the design thinking. When you start using a bunch of sticky notes and markers and <laughs> tangible ways of representing thoughts, uh, tangible ways. So it's a kind of a counterbalance of the digitality. And so using design thinking techniques may be a response to the efficiency that to many extent ChatGPT is bringing into many fields. Awesome. Okay, uh, I have so many questions here. I'm gonna open it to, uh, to discussion after one more question. Um, you both talked about AI literacy as an important, increasingly important skill set going forward. I totally agree. Um, I'm asking this on behalf of myself, but also my many friends who are parents of young children who are so scared, <laughs> like they just don't know what to do anymore and are just genuinely confused about what they should teach their kids and like how to prepare them for this, in this new world, basically. So uh, do you have advice for my friends, basically? <laughs> <laughs> what does AI literacy mean, really, to you? Lauren, maybe we can start with well, you. Well, I have kids. And, yeah. uh, I've, I've wondered and worried about that myself, especially because, uh, as I said right at the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm no AI expert, right. um, I, and I, I prefer to read books and stick my head in the sand. <laughs> like, it's worked for me so far. It's not, it's not gonna work anymore. That's, right. There really is a change coming. Um, well, I've always felt like I wanted my kids to learn things that I don't know and to learn especially um, computational things that are absolutely dictating the world that they're growing up in and the world they're going to inherit. But it's, but, but what do you do with that? I've been, on the one hand, relatively pleasantly surprised at what's been built into the Ontario curriculum. My kids just go to Toronto Public Schools that um, is, is trying in its modest way to keep up with the times, certainly including things that weren't there when I was there. Um, and so in principle, all kids get that baseline. But as with so many things, um, inequities and, and games ensue even when we're trying to provide something universal or something that will equip all young people to deal with the world they're inheriting. Um, I think anything that's technology-based is likely to be extra guilty of this. And um, as I mentioned, you know, teachers are really struggling and they just went through COVID. COVID severely amplified the disparities that already existed between students. The kind of learning or the kinds of resources and support that are necessary on average to become really AI literate are those that are already going to be more accessible to affluent students or to students who happen to end up in the right classroom or with the right teacher. There's also, let's not forget, a huge gender element here. Boys are much more likely to be you know, encouraged to learn to code, to play video games, to learn the basics of of, of computation from a very young age, even recreationally, before it becomes educationally mandatory. And I've seen my kids, who are both girls, push back a bit to my horror. I mean, you know, I'm raising them feminists, but I'm like, you need to learn this. And like, eh, <laughs> some more boys. Okay. So I think we're up against, uh, you know, not just learning challenges and not just policy choices about how to scale this or how to get this into public education, which, as I said, I think people are really working at. I think, unfortunately, we're also up against all the social and cultural baggage right. and all of the economic and, um, and other disparities that impact who gets access to what important knowledge and who, who has the power to use and appropriate new technologies for purposes that serve them best. So I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> I do have kids too, and uh, well, I'm concerned about the uh, unbalanced uh, and the 
the role of humanities uh, in this um, technological uh, setting. So I think uh, that might be, well, the, the AI um, uh, mainstream um, revolution may be an opportunity to retrieve uh, the, the value of humanities in the educational curriculum. Because essentially, when, once we focus on uh, risks, uh, issues, concerns about AI, we are talking about not technological problems. We are talking about humanistic problems, so about, about uh, disciplines like uh, ethics, uh, moral philosophy, and, and in general, the field of humanities that can help us make sense of this um, technology. So we cannot uh, solve a technological problem using technology. We need to use it, we need to solve a technological problem by culture. And by culture means contextualizing the uh, emerging technologies within the broader context of the humanistic knowledge, the humanistic uh, tradition. Um, universities may retrieve those, that, 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 that kind of curriculum, um, education of all ranks. So even to overcome those kind of disparities about, okay, STEM is more for boys or uh, vice versa, which is actually true. So in the humanities, there are more female in general. So I, I think we need to overcome that kind of uh, uh, differentiations and uh, retrieving the value of humanities in a, such a technological world. Amazing, thank you so much. So we'll open it up to discussions from the crowd. There's a bunch of hands already. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry. All right, thank you uh, both of you for fascinating discussion. So I actually want to uh, kind of extend the, the last question about student inequity. So whenever there is technological use in classroom, there is certainly inequity caused by difference in access to the technology or difference in literacy on how to use the technology. But there is a different kind of inequity that I don't know how to think about as an educator, which is that even if all the students have access to the technology and know how to use it, students will end up using to a tool like ChatGPT in different ways. And I've seen a couple of preliminary studies now uh, where which show that uh, students who are performing academically better, uh, they use ChatGPT to augment their learning and actually learn better, uh, whereas students who are not performing academically well, uh, they use ChatGPT mainly to kind of try and achieve a better grade, uh, and, and perhaps it kind of degrades their learning. And so if if a tool like ChatGPT kind of uh, uh, takes some of the brightest minds that our education system produces and makes them even brighter while degrading the average learning quality, how do we as educators uh, think about that? And when I think about this, I, I'm kind of hard pressed to think the, the, uh, the goal that I should be serving as an educator. Is my goal to provide fair access uh, to kind of fair opportunities for learning in the classroom, but subject to that produce the brightest minds? Or is my goal to, to optimize kind of the average learning in the classroom? And so I would love your take on, on the, the kind of the impact of these kind of technologies on inequity based mainly on kind of how students end up using this kind of technology in different ways. I think we're just learning how students are using them. I, I just think it's very early, and I can't fathom all the ways that students might use them. Um, but I, I will, at the risk of just being obnoxious, return to the, my, my point that it depends what we think they're learning, what we want them to learn. So what does it mean to facilitate fair opportunity for learning in a classroom, which I think is you know, a reasonable goal, and you know, we may never achieve it perfectly, but that's a good direction to steer in. It depends what you mean by learning. Um, th there are probably a lot of things for which ChatGPT will not be especially useful. So the students who are better at using it to learn some things may not find it's to their advantage in other areas. And if they start to rely on ChatGPT for their learning, and they could, in theory, you know, not do as well as uh, in other areas. I don't know. I could I could try to come up with examples, but let's just stipulate that there are such examples. Um, in the meantime, though, it's really a question of what AI literacy consists in and what we think students need and, and what non-AI skills and knowledge are that we still value and why we still value them. Um, maybe another time I'll go to the wall and defend learning grammar, but I'm not gonna <laughs> do that right now. Well, uh, just a, a quick note on this. If we look back at the history of media and technologies um, 
in communication media as well. So um, unfortunately, any new technology brought advantages to a few and disadvantages to many. That happened in the entire history of humankind. But it took a long while for, uh, let's say, the printed book uh, to, again, become a mass medium and then uh, democratize, democratize or uh, opening up uh, and, and overcoming some um, equity boundaries. It took uh, centuries. So now that the pace is so fast, uh, I think we are now, we have the opportunity to identify the inequalities that are embedded into the idea that a new technology will serve the uh, advantages of a few and, 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 and disadvantages for many. Uh, we have a way to address these topics, not to do the same uh, mistake with it, uh, for instance, with the internet. Uh, eventually, we let internet grow as a wild forest, and now it's mostly controlled by a few uh, companies. So by design, uh, institutions and education institutions, I think, uh, should play a role in not leaving anyone behind. Uh, I think that if AI tools are going to integrate within universities, uh, uh, universities should, uh, or schools, uh, should provide uh, those tools uh, to everyone without, again, uh, not creating uh, uh, inequalities in the access. So nowadays, for instance, we think, we think of internet or internet access uh, as a kind of human right. So it's a right, so everywhere. So we, we have the right to, to access to internet. So likely, in, uh, sh shortly, in a, few, in a few years, there will be the right of using the most advanced AI tools uh, as a way to democratize, uh, democratize uh, uh, as a way to, to, to make this uh, uh, open and uh, um, equally accessible to everyone. I'm really skeptical of that. I, no matter what's offered in school, um, as soon as kids leave school, they, they return to their inequitable environments. I mean, you could, you could have all of the technology. It's not even, if it's just software, it's not even expensive, right? You could have the, you know, all the AI on the computers at school. They already have computers at school. But, who goes home and has amazing hardware in their own room and a headset and a million games to play around with and all the time in the world and supportive parents to do an extra six hours of learning on AI after school? And who goes home and you know doesn't have those material resources or has to work a job to, to contribute to the family income or has to take care of an ailing parent or something and doesn't have time, no matter how gifted they are, to use those tools? I mean, we, we know just in all educational areas, these disparities start before kids get to school, they get compounded over time, and no matter how much technology we provide at school, even at school, I mean, the, even in the Toronto School Board, the schools in affluent neighbor, neighborhoods have more resources than the public schools in less affluent neighborhoods because the parents can contribute more and the parents supply all kinds of volunteer labor um, and field trips and things like that, and guest speakers that the other schools don't. So, it, unfortunately, I'm just I'm, not, I'm very skeptical yeah. about the democratization point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Julia. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this, um, Lauren. I, I think I want to ask a little bit about sort of the cheating framework, just from the point of view. You sort of say, well, what are we trying to accomplish? And I sort of think, well, why do we evaluate? in education anyway. Why do we do that at all? And, and I, I think the, the main answer is because we're using that as an incentive scheme, and it's an incentive scheme because it has all these not, you know, if you want to get into that special high school, if you want to get into that university, that program, if you want to get that job. Um, and so I think about the ways in which, I mean, I, I answered the question at the beginning about being optimistic, but it's because I'm optimistic, it will kind of blow up, you know, what I think is quite broken in a lot of our education. Now, I don't have your expertise in, in K to 12, and I think it is really quite important to, to pay different attention to that, but I've done a lot of thinking about what's broken with legal education for 20 years. Um, and to be honest, most law schools don't teach people what they today need to know to be lawyers. We screen them, we give them standardized exams, we teach actually in a 19th century fashion. And why? And then the pressure is, and so the fairness point was, oh, well, it's, it's because a certain number of them will get 
the grades that will get them the jobs and that you know we're anyway so I'm just I'm just wondering about sort of just the framing on cheating and I, I, I didn't quite hear that piece of what you were uh, so, and I'm sure you've been thinking about it so I just wanted to maybe ask you to say a bit more. Sure, thank, there's, there's a lot of important stuff there. I think in the end your question was maybe less about cheating, more about why assessment at all assessment? and you know che cheating only emerges as a category of significance against a backdrop of fair assessment that we care about um, and yes, a huge amount is broken in the assessment system but I mean, maybe a few points in defense of assessment, especially at K-12. So there's different kinds of assessment. Formative assessment is, is more diagnostic. It's to help the instructor see where the student is so that they can learn better, which seems like pedagogically a good idea, right? Not all assessment is consequential. Even the, the much maligned EQAO, which just happened, if anyone has kids in grades three, six, or nine in Ontario that just happened, which is standardized testing done by the government of Ontario, it doesn't actually impact the students' grades or educational outcomes. It's data collection. Whether it's useful data collection is, is another question. So not all assessment tracks opportunities, rewards, or punishments in the same way. I think we're really concerned about the assessments that do, or at least your questions point in that direction. And I'm very concerned about them too. Um, at the same time, I think as broken as that chain is from what do we want students to learn, what are we assigning them to demonstrate their learning, how are we assessing what they've learned, how are we communicating with other people such as future teachers or possible employers or universities about how well they performed, that's a very broken chain. The notion that we need to use formal education to sort people is really hard to get away from, and I don't, I don't think we should get away from it. I think we just need to continually revise it and think about how to do it better. Grades are a proxy for st what students have done, and we can think of lots of ways in which they're poor proxies. But if university can't accept all of the high school students who apply, it need, and it can't individually get to know every high school student who applies to university, the numbers are just simply unmanageable. We're dealing with giant societies. We need shortcuts. We've landed on grades as a kind of shortcut, at least in this transition from you know, high school to university and from course to course. And, and as I said, I teach in grad school only, and I think grades are bullshit, excuse me. They make no sense in grad school. But it's the continuation of this unreflective system where maybe they used to make sense or they make sense in younger grades. As bad as they are, um, not, we have to differentiate. We, we just have an unmanageable amount of diversity among the student body, and we have to allocate scarce resources and opportunities in some appropriate fashion. So we use assessments and grades as a shortcut. I don't think that's wrong in itself. I think what's concerning is when we, we get into these ruts of assuming that a grade means a certain thing and then you get grade inflation and then it's a collective action problem and nobody will change their ways because then their students don't get in because the other school down the street didn't prevent grade inflation. I think it's a problem when we rely on assessments like the classic essay, which maybe worked for a long time and maybe today because of things like ChatGPT is not getting at what we should really care about or is not verifiable in the way that we want it to be. So I don't know how much that answers your question, but I think, yeah, there's, there's problems at all levels. And at the same time, I think we don't want to blow up the notion of assessment entirely. We're using, we need it for some purposes. Great. Uh, yeah. Yep. Is that muted? Is it not muted? Okay, good. Yeah. I want to, one of the things that the gentleman said during his talk sort of struck me, and it brings to mind the idea of a Turing test textbook. Um, in the context of large language models interacting with them and its capability of hallucinating and making up spurious results, we're all familiar now with the, MI, the wildly fallacious MIT study on taking tests and the systematic deconstruction of that. How does that help students having a chat textbook that is unaware of out of distribution questions, that has no concept, no rooting in reality? And so the student then interacts with this chat bot that is now making up spurious facts and educating them. 
I, I'm sort of curious, you set up a framework, it was really interesting, but when you start to deconstruct it, it becomes terrifying quickly. Yeah. No, thank you, uh, absolutely, absolutely relevant. I think uh, my idea of building a chat bot uh, based on a textbook, so turning uh, a cluster of knowledge into a, um, the possibility of, for engaging in a dialogue is, not, is intended mostly to foster the sense of engagement that even a simple reading can give. So if you read a good book, you engage yourself in a dialogue with the author. Right, so, and it's the most beautiful thing of reading, the silent reading that really uh, brings you in dialogue with the author. So my, my idea on, um, on uh, turning a textbook uh, into a chat bot or chat book uh, is to simply foster that sense of relationship uh, with knowledge. The relationship that is based on dialogue, that is based on conversation, that is based on interaction, rather than just uh, reading. And by the way, generally speaking, reading changed drastically over the past few years. So reading is no longer reading, uh, it's a scanning, it's, a, it's a skimming, it's a, there is a different uh, relationship with, with the very written text. This way, I think we cannot go back to where we were before, so <laughs> forcing students to read uh, cover by cover, uh, an important book, so otherwise they read the, literally only the covers. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's a structural change, it's a systemic change, an environmental change, uh, instead of trying to go back where we were before, I conceive this um, chat book, uh, or even ChatGPT itself, uh, as a new form of reading, a new form of interface of knowledge. Like uh, it was Google back, uh, back in the late 90s, so it provided us with an interface with a huge uh, set of information, and so we learned uh, how to use it. So I think as an interface, uh, uh, um, for knowledge will uh, will change the way we evaluate knowledge. So if we change the interface, we, if we change uh, the, the, the way of engagement between a, a corpus of knowledge and the actual student learner, we will have to change the way we evaluate, we assess. And I think that's an elephant in the room. So particularly in the university education, at some point we need to uh, take uh, a brave move uh, to overcome the way we conceive assessment, grades, uh, uh, marking systems, and so on, in light of this changing in, changes in the way students read, the way students engage with, in particular, uh, ChatGPT or this dialogical way of learning. That will lead to a change in the assessment. Uh, that doesn't mean, well, changing the assignment necessarily. It, it doesn't mean, but it means providing, for instance, a good feedback, regardless the actual uh, grade or marks. So a good, we, we, as educators, we should get paid to provide an excellent feedback in order to help the student uh, uh, take the most of that feedback without necessarily being uh, under the constraints of a grade that will determine your GPA and so far and so on. It's an elephant in the room. I'm, I'm glad uh, it popped up. And, uh, and I think uh, optimistically maybe AI tools may help us rethink the way we evaluate our students, maybe using AI tools to evaluate, to provide a, a, a technical evaluation uh, based on that uh, dialogical way of learning that I, I'm, I'm advocating today. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks very much for a really important talk. I wanted to share a, um, a couple of solutions actually relating to this gentleman's question that I've heard from instructors in the higher ed space and then, and then get your reactions. One, on this idea of hallucination, one concept that I've heard from faculty is getting them to use chat GPT to uh, come up with an answer and then as, as a group 
looking at and verifying, doing the fact-checking stage, given that these things do hallucinate, and going beyond mere fact-checking into how is it organized, what's the tone that's taken, is it fair, is it reasonable, so bringing critical thinking to the output of the chat GPT as one response to this coming into the pedagogy. And the other in terms of, um, you know, writing as a form of assessment or, or knowledge check is moving much more to a process. A lot of instructors, I think, are doing this. So instead of focusing on handing your essay, I'll evaluate it and give you feedback, um, it starts out with, first of all, for 5% of the mark, show me the outline, just the outline and then show me a draft. And then the instructor might provide some feedback. So if we can use a little pun, that would be the RLHF phase, ha ha ha. <laughs> uh, but this would be in real life human, human feedback. Uh, and then followed up by a presentation and finally submission of the paper. So what do you think about this, um, you know, critiquing the output strategy and then uh, shifting to a process approach as opposed to a product? approach as interventions or responses? So first of all, I think if ChatGPT starts uh, hallucinating and producing hallucinations, it means that uh, you don't know how to use it. It means that you didn't use it properly. I, I heard colleagues having fun of ChatGPT, making up uh, uh, quotations or sources or hallucinations, but if it's hallucinating, it means that you are not using it properly. Because ChatGPT is dialogic, it must be trained, so only after a long training in terms of setting the context, setting the tone, setting the sources, setting many other parameters, only then, so you narrow down to a specific cluster of knowledge and then you avoid hallucinations. That's why I think uh, just asking something and getting a hallucination, it's a funny experiment, uh, but it's not meaningful, not relevant. So I think uh, we should uh, take uh, the hallucinations aside because it means that hallucinations uh, means that mean that one is not using uh, the system, the tool properly, properly. And um, the second question, uh, uh, the, the, the process of the problem. Well, ChatGPT can produce an outline, outline, can produce a draft, can produce pretty much everything because of the, the so that's why uh, one could say, okay, let's do an outline without using ChatGPT, maybe in class. So for instance, I believe in the sense of collective originality, as you mentioned, in design thinking session. In a design thinking session, no aids, no technology, you just bring yourself and uh, you stimulate the synergy between different minds. I think uh, learning how to work together will be another good uh, uh, effect of ChatGPT. In an age where ChatGPT can customize, it can help you working individually, working together, working collaboratively, taking the most of that collective intelligence may be more relevant. Otherwise, again, draft outlines and all these things are, are technically doable, particularly after the training uh, uh, portion. So, because again, any, any language model must be trained. Even ChatGPT itself can be trained using that, that specific chat. So we're building our own data set, so with, um, with about um, uh, 10 million uh, characters, uh, all about uh, a specific subject, because we wanted to make sure that the information is reliable and uh, avoiding hallucination, because essentially we are uh, staying within the boundaries of our, uh, of our um, uh, data set. Um, so briefly, the teachers are also using these strategies at the pre-college level. On the, f I, I would have slightly different reactions to each of them. So on the sort of critiquing the chat GPT output, um, I, mean, I think that's great. I think that's a, a really important kind of step toward the kind of AI literacy that we need and that we can manage. I think it still also highlights the, the limits of what we're likely to achieve through AI literacy. I think, for example, you go through this exercise a number of times, maybe you discover there's a number of hallucinations or 
I, I, I'm, I'm agnostic on, on whether you can avoid hallucinations. I, I can't speak to that. But let's say you discover that you're going to form, because of the way that our finite, pathetic brains work, you know, some sort of meta conclusion, like I either trust this thing or I don't trust this thing. Or I either trust this type of thing or I don't trust it. And like I said before, like I don't think it's accidental. We're seeing so much more um, irrational thinking, conspiracy theories, polarization, tribalism, because we cannot handle this amount of complexity and precarity. We are not really good. Now I'm speaking as an armchair psychologist. I'm not at all a psychologist. But it just strikes me that we're not smart enough to deal with sometimes these things are true and reliable and sometimes these things aren't true and reliable. And we have all of these implicit biases and all of these cognitive effects that set us up to believe certain things or not believe certain things irrespective of what's really true. We're not really rational, but let's use critical thinking to overcome all of that. <laughs> it, like, you know, we, we do need to hone our critical thinking to the extent that we can. I'm just, so yes, that's a good strategy and teachers are using it and experimenting with it. And I think we'll get more information as time progresses about how well these things work and how students respond to them, but it's not a panacea. Um, on the second point, well, again, I think as Paolo pointed out, that doesn't get around the cheating concern. Like if you want the students to write their own outline, the only way to do it is to do it kind of in real time in front of you or something, which is fine, but that just strikes me as good pedagogy. Like I think teaching writing as a process, which I've always usually done, I've always asked my students to hand in a proposal for a big paper, for example, it's like a proposal for a dissertation. You know, that, that's good pedagogy. And maybe it's even more important these days, but without at least tweaking it, it's not going to be um, chat GPT proof. Amazing. Okay, yes. Thank you for the, the really uh, great presentation. I wanted to ask a question. I think we've already kind of glossed over this, but with respect to scholarships in particular, um, where do your thoughts stand in terms of whether we should just get rid of academic merit-based scholarships or if we should keep them but alter them in some way now that, you know, Dr. Bialstock mentioned we're thinking about originality not being a good proxy for things like creative minds um, or determining whether a mind is creative. Um, and things along those lines. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um, it's, it's probably kind of out of scope of what I can speak to here, and I don't, I don't have like a detailed answer or worked out theory, but I would not dispense with academic scholarships or merit-based judgments. Um, I would just question how, they're, how the judgments are being arrived at. Yeah. I agree. Okay, one more, yeah. Um, so, thanks again for the nice conversation. So, my question was that, so now we talk about ChatGPT as being one service, and but this is a very fast developing technology, and in future, this is going to, we can all guess that it's going to change, and there might be multiple different services and multiple different language models with different capabilities of their own. So, as educators, how do you choose which language model will you use in the class? And if there is a service, let's say, who are adapting these language models for educators, what special capabilities should that language model have that is different than a generic one? I don't know what would make the, the best um, large language model for educators or how one might choose between sort of theoretical alternatives. But I will say that we know from plenty of other experience that what determines what ends up in a classroom or in a textbook or in the hands of teachers is often a matter of variables far outside of what is educationally best. There are corporate interests here that are not minor. And I, I know Avery has talked about the, <laughs> the importance of not overlooking the, the corporate nature of um, open AI. And we, you know, this may be different in kind in terms of how it affects education, but we have plenty of experience knowing how companies and institutions and governments with their own interests make choices about what is best for students or what should be mainstreamed within education. And we should be 
suspicious of some of their, their motives there. So I, I can't, unfortunately, answer your question at a more granular level, um, but I think that whatever technologies emerge and whatever kind of school tech partnerships and things like that start to emerge in the name of AI literacy and things we care about, we should always you know, take their incentives with a grain of salt. It, it, it may not be what we want most for our students. Yeah, I totally agree. Why not um, uh, imagine in the future um, AI as a public service, like uh, any other public services, the postal services uh, in a country? So I think uh, going beyond uh, thinking in the mid to long term, um, we may envision something like this. If I, well, uh, had the ability to choose a, 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 a generative AI model for education, the ability to build your own data set, uh, to create your own uh, cluster of knowledge. So like any professor does with a syllabus. So if you design a syllabus, essentially you select uh, the sources of knowledge in your field uh, that you find uh, more compelling uh, in, in creating your course. And then, of course, uh, uh, building on that. So imagine creating your syllabus, but in terms of the actual sources. So a data set, a customizable data set in a very easiest way, in a very easy way, and, and, and create a, 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 a chat GPT based on your syllabus. Uh, I, I like to see something like this. Amazing. We're out of time, so let's thank our speakers again.